Um, the minutes were sent out. In, 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 in. You didn't see. Them. You couldn't open. Them. I can go to my email. The agenda is like no point. Everything opened is up the agenda for me. So I'm going to go to what I sent. So we want the minutes? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> so they are. And I can share my screen, although there's no one else. Yeah. Share screen. I don't see a green share screen. Oh, right there. I don't know if it's sharing my screen, but we can look it's, at it it's here. The sound wasn't working last time. <laughs> so this was reviewing the minutes, additions, deletions, preparing for the August election. And the links on the Secretary of State's website were broken. Oh, and there was talk about if the justices don't, if the caucus, if the parties don't caucus, what happens in relation to JP nominations. And um, if the parties didn't caucus, three members of a party could hold a meeting and do all the paperwork that the caucus would do, or a candidate could run as an independent is what we found out. I make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Thank you. Kathy Paris. Is there a chance to read it? Mm -hmm. Anybody have comment on the minutes? All those in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. Opposed? Minutes are accepted. Um, it's one of those. <laughs> and there were additions and deletions. Yep, so that I also sent, and I can pull it up in my email. There's copies there. And that opened fine on my, on my computer, at least. So the additions and deletions are all on the same. Um, download blocked. Click on that. No, still left with that. I didn't see it. Now go up there and yep, right there. See the little flat right there. Yeah. Click on it. Yep. And then allow it. I didn't notice anything when I went through it. Yeah, I went through it and nothing. 
Yeah, there was just one person who wasn't 18 yet, um, Riley McCarthy, but she will be turning 18 before the November 5th election. And I noticed that Shane Bettis, his name was on there twice. As a transfer, right. Okay, so these are additions at the top. There were 87 additions. And then that ends with uh, Yandow. And if we want to move on to deletions. Yeah, jump on motion or two motion? We do want to Okay, I would approve additions as presented. The 80, 87, 87, addi 87 additions to the voters list as presented. Peter and Carol Smith. So, yeah. So, what about Shane Bennis? His name's on there. Tonight. Yes. So, if we go to deletions, um, these are transfers within the state of Vermont. So, some of these voters have been purged from oh. the Jericho checklist, but their information is getting transferred from the Jericho purged list to, in his case, Barrytown. And so he was probably in Jericho for a long time and he, he may have actually, well, he does have two voter IDs. Nope, those actually look like the same voter ID. But um, it, it could be... <laughs> So actually, I don't know, with the same voter ID, that doesn't make much sense because that sounds like more than one, that sounds like the same voter being transferred. Um, but either way, he's not on the Jericho checklist anymore and he should only appear once in Barrytown, but I actually can't confirm um, what Barrytown's checklist looks like. And so these are all... Um, people that have moved within Jericho are moved out of Jericho, but within stayed within the state of Vermont. And so Ben is here to Rutland city. That makes sense. I know that Paul and Carol Gross have moved to New Hampshire. They, yeah, I haven't but got, their, but their house hasn't yet sold. And this, they're, they're not on the deletions list. They have not registered in, well, I haven't received out of state notification. That's the next thing. Um, the purged people, they have either, we have a death notice or we receive notification from out of state that they registered in another um, state. So I have not received that yet with the grosses, but the grosses did let me know what their new address was in New Hampshire, just if I wanted to contact them. Um, they were mailed a ballot, but the ballots don't get forwarded. So I actually have it as an undeliverable ballot. And I don't know if their intention is to vote in Vermont or New Hampshire for the November primary. So we shouldn't just add them to the deletions then? Um, we can't without some action from the voter. Okay. So they could, so they, they, drove up here or got their ballot somehow they could vote here is that legal yeah we can't chat we can't do well we can't do a systematic challenge um of voters 90 days before an election is it legal for them to vote i'm not i'm not worked out i'm just mostly curious could they they get could their ballot and yeah vote it and we count it yeah so actually there were some people that live on Blueberry Lane. Does anyone know where that is in Jericho? <laughs> Off of Packard Road. They um they sold their house the end of September. They're moving to Delaware, but right now they're like in between. Yeah. So they they actually didn't get their ballot in the mail, but they came and voted early mm -hmm. in September, closed on their house at the end of September, and now yeah. are in transition yeah. to middle bear into Delaware. maryland or delaware but they have to they don't have a permanent address there yeah. so they know that they can only vote once in the federal election so yeah. it's not it's not a problem as, as long as they're yeah, only vote. voting in one state so the grosses would have the same yeah 
Okay, I would, I would make a motion to accept the list of 17 deletions. There's more than that, though. There's 17 purged. Well, 17, the 17 purged. Plus and, uh, 71 transfers. Transfer deletions. Second. So the additions and the deletions have both been moved and seconded. Any comments on either? We're voting on a whole package. I'm just going to go back to make sure there's nobody waiting in the waiting room. I don't know. Oh, go here. Nope. All those in favor of accepting the additions and deletions as presented? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Preparing. So as of yesterday, we had 307 ballots um, returned <laughs> and we made them into batch one. Generally, we put them in batches of 80 to 100. So Megan was like, we can't do this again because she had to like confirm the number. <laughs> um, so we have batch one anyway. And there was probably 100 returned today. You just put one in? <laughs> um so we actually just got the memory cards for the machines today there was a delay in our uh senate district because there was a candidate added after the primary election which that was all at the secretary of state level apparently if you don't run all the candidates on the primary ballot the party can nominate people to fill that. So I didn't know that. You mean um, if there are two seats and you only nominate one? So actually we vote for three senators. And yeah, then, but, but, and then if, if a party only nominated two on the primary ballot, the party can then add a third one? Um, yes. I, they, I, I think they could probably nominate up to three, but they only nominated one additional. So there are... Um, five candidates, I think, in the Senate race now, and we can vote for three, plus there's three write-in spaces. So anyway, the ballots got printed, and the Secretary of State's office said, oh, we have this thing going on, we haven't resolved it yet, hold the ballots, and then they, in the same day, they said, mail the ballots, <laughs> and then the next day they said, let us know if you mailed any because we want you to hold them. <laughs> They're gonna re and then they decided they were gonna reprint them. So the reprinted ballots have a yellow stripe at the top that says where Jericho is, and the machine is only coded to take the new ballots. And none of the Jericho ballots went out because I could tell <laughs> that I didn't have a confirmed answer. And uh so the Secretary of State's office actually sent a representative down to take the first printed ballots. And then we got the new ballots um, around September 30th, I think. And also they were coordinating the statewide mailing. So if the ballots that we sent out that like that I voted on is like a that. yellow has correct. a yellow stripe on it. Yeah. Okay. So it, you were about that. Yeah. So we're all. Everyone so has good. the same balance. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it could be potential for disaster. Do you want to um, tally absentee ballots prior to the election? I would like to. And um, if we do it during the day, we don't have to warn it as a separate activity, but we can do it outside of normal office hours and just warn it that it's happening because it's public. People can come and watch. Um Actually, do we want to talk about that right now? Because I made a little whiteboard. <laughs> um, I know Dave Thuler wasn't able to come today, and I asked if he was available at all the week of October 28th. Because um, I know he likes evening times better than um, day times, but he is not available. So, I was thinking pairs of two. Anything else? Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking pairs of two, and um, Monday, October 28th, was the first day I picked 
either an 8.30 session or a 10.30 morning session. I can't do 8 o'clock because we're sometimes making the batches with what comes in in the drop box. So I'd, be, I'd like a half hour before we um, start with the early. And so it could be two pairs, four people, or it could be two people at 8.30 and two people at 10.30. Tuesday, October 29th could be morning or afternoon. Wednesday, October 30th. Oh, I said no on Halloween, probably. <laughs> and I, we have done Saturdays in the past, and that's sometimes it's easier when it's quiet, nothing else is going on. Um, and then it, November of 2020, we actually did have a session the night before at MMU. So the voting machines, the boxes get transferred on Friday to Mount Mansfield and we need the box to do the early processing. So if we wanted to do early processing during the day on Monday, I would just be holding off back that box, but I'd have to get it to the school Monday night. Have I shared enough info? Everyone's kind of done it before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to be out of town Tuesday through Thursday of that week, but we'd be glad to do a couple of shifts on Monday and or Friday or Saturday. Okay. So that we can slot me in wherever we can. You're, you have surgery at some point. Monday the 28th, so I was just going to say if you're going to do anything before the 28th, I think. Um, that uh, would be. I don't know if you want to back it up that far. Friday the 25th, Thursday the 24th. Your surgery went? 28th. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the week of the 21st, we, as of right now, we could schedule one day during the week of the 21st because we have at least 300 ballots already to go. We're doing. Mary and I are going out to Jerry Hill on the third. Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday, October 23rd, we're doing mobile polling. Ballots. Is that now? 23rd. The 23rd. I could. Do you want to do it before or after? What time? Uh... 10 30, we were going to meet here to be at Jerry Hill for 11. And then I, if I have any JP delivery requests, I was gonna tag that on to that day. <laughs> but um, so eleven to noon is when we're at Jack Jerry Hill. Eleven to noon. You want to do ballots after that? We can. Sure. Or do um, so it doesn't make any difference. No. I can do it early or I can do it after. We do it after I'm going to do it. Like one to three? So we'll do it. Yeah, fine. Is there anyone else that wants to? Do we want two pairs that day? Or, yeah, I could do it as long as it was like no earlier than one. Yep. So That's one o'clock one thing. What day is it? Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, October 23rd. Okay. Um, so I could. Actually, I think you Megan is here, so I could pair Megan. <laughs> with, I could pair Megan with this group, so we'd have two. Okay. Um. So that's one session. The uh, next week, uh, is there a day? Um. I didn't do anything but um the 29th. Okay, would you want to do morning or afternoon on the 29th? Okay. Um, is there anyone else who's the 29th afternoon Tom? Yeah. And then you said morning of the 28th? Um I just anything but the 29th. I could do 10 30. Yeah. Well, I'm not yeah, 10 is more fun for me. Well, I've got something that ends at 10, so I can oh. come right over. So that works. And Carol's yeah. not. And I can do anything on the 28th at any time. 
Wednesday afternoon or morning. So is there anyone else the afternoon on the 29th or the 30th? I can do the afternoon on the 30th. Of the 30th. Yeah. And that's the one? Carol Cantor Smith. Yeah, one of the is there a potential person like on Wednesday that I mean Tuesday the 29th at one? One. At one o'clock. Twenty nine, right? Tuesday the twenty ninth, one o'clock. And then do we want to wait and see where we are on Saturday? Yeah, because Mary and I are gonna do at least three hundred. Oh no. <laughs> yes, you okay, you'll get the first batch. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> That yeah, then we can decide we need this Saturday to catch up. Okay. And then they can also be ballot process down election day. <clears throat> right. They um I do have two people who, so the ballots that are pre-checked in, I have a group that can do that, but then it gets complicated because there's the other ballots that arrived the night before or the night of. I mean, the day of, they're not pre-checked on the checklist, so they have to get checked off. So it just takes longer to process them on election day. So it's usually about three different sessions um, during the day on election day. So, oh, there are three participants. I guess they're here. Nope, they're in the waiting room. Oh, oh there are people oh, for the seven o'clock. Yeah. Seven o'clock. Oh, so we have the early absentee balloting out of the way. Election work schedule is just on recruiting election officials. Um, I did go to the high school on Tuesday and talked with a student activities council and they, um, not all of them were from Jericho, but it was about 30 students and there was a lot of interest in working at the polls. They want to do something to help. So um haven't got any emails yet <laughs> from them, but I gave them potential times, two hour shifts that are kind of in between our shifts. So like we start at seven o'clock and they would start at eight. So the person that they're sitting next to would already have an hour into the shift. Um, but it's worked well in the past. Um, and actually, they asked really good questions. I was, um, I was, uh, election worker training. So actually, we're kind of at seven o'clock, and there's a couple people that have joined us online um, for the election worker training. Do you have a schedule for workers for the election day? Um, I have it started, but I can take. Do we want to go around now to kind of figure out where, because I'd like to have a BCA member at, at least at each of the three hour shifts. Um, my usual. So six, 6.30 or 6.45, 9.30, to end. So actually let's start at the back. Um, I'm, I would like to have two pairs of people doing write-in tally, the front of the ballot and the back of the ballot. The back of the ballot is the justice of the peace race. And that gets complicated because you can choose up to 12. And that group also ranks 
the votes one through 12. Um, and I, I did talk with Dave Schuler a bit and I just wanted to point out. So the law allows for justice, current justices of the peace to be working at the election. Like if there was a new candidate for justice of the peace, which there is, yeah. that person would not be able to work the election, but the justice of the peace can. And I, I believe, although I can't find it in writing, the appointed members of the BCA can also work the work the election and do the result tally. So that would include Mary and Dave working the working in the shifts. And I, is everyone in agreement with that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that their point? What's that? They're elected for that purpose. Right? They're, so point, reason, they're appointed. They're appointed for that purpose. purpose. But for that reason, yeah. 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 And they're not on the ballot either, so we don't have that. Davis. 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 Um, so who would like to do the write-in tally at the end of the night? Oh, so <laughs> Is that a Peter Booth? <laughs> and I think I, I don't have Callan confirmed oh, yeah. yet. Um, but Dave Schuler is also available. And then um, is there anyone else who wants to do a nighttime? It's needed. I've done it before, so unless I'm counting. All right. So six thirty a.m. Mary Coburn. Um, nine thirty. Michelle. And Kathy. Twelve thirty. Mike. And three thirty. Uh, Carol Cantor Smith. So that's good. I have a BCA member at each one. Is there Kathleen? I usually do three thirty. Yeah, hours. Kathleen. I did your wrong initials. Oh wait a minute. No, I did Carol Cantor Smith, but also at three thirty or at five. Three thirty. Yeah, okay, so probably. Kathleen. Yeah. If you need something else? Let me know. Is there anyone I'm missing? Tom, you're gonna. You set up for the takedown. Okay. As usual. And set up. Do you need more help with writings? So I'll I'll put you down. I can stay for okay. writings. Would you? Because a lot of times we don't know until mm -hmm. we open it. And because <laughs> there was that one year, I don't know what it was, but it was awful write-ins. Yeah. Well, we didn't have <laughs> we didn't have Peter. <laughs> There was, and there were many weird write-ins. Yeah. That's how, like, that's how it goes. Real yeah. that's how it goes. I think I've got someone in the waiting room. Okay. The write-ins that we could ignore. The, the, the VMCTA, the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association, has lobbied to have the person declare their write-in status before the election so that you just have to count those write-ins, but it has not gone. No. And the Secretary of State's office tried, you know, they backed. They're supportive of it? They're in support of it. Yeah. Somebody declaring that they were writing candidates before the election, and then they can be, then you can be looking for that. All right. So it looks like we have three members on. Do we need to adjourn Zoom. this meeting? No, this is all part of it. Um, so as far as election worker training, um, I mostly wanted to ask, have people ask questions, but I also made the book so that if we wanted to do like a mock check-in and if the person had their ballot or not, and if they needed an affidavit, because um, because every all active voters were mailed a ballot. Um, when you look at the um, checklist in the absentee section, they're all issued, which is you know different than other elections that we've worked. So everyone looks like they're an early absentee voter. Exceptions to that are people who were not 18 yet, if they didn't, if they hadn't taken the voter's oath, 
they were not automatically mailed a ballot and challenged voters were not automatically mailed a ballot. Um, <clears throat> there's that My Voter page where people can respond to the challenge. And I've actually gotten some electronic responses to that. So when someone responds that, yes, they're still in Jericho, they may have changed their address. So they responded to the challenge. If they become active, then I mail them a ballot. So they're like everyone else and they get issued a ballot. So uh, if someone comes from another town, <laughs> if they transferred before September 3rd, the Secretary of State's office did not have their, um, they had their name on the Jericho checklist. So they were mailed a Jericho ballot. But if they came to Jericho after September 3rd, they um, have to sign an affidavit that they're not using the ballot that was mailed to them. Like say they came from Colchester. Colchester would have, they would have received the statewide mailing with a Colchester ballot, but most of the time election mail isn't forwarded. So the voter probably didn't get it. It probably got returned undeliverable to Colchester, but the voter still signs an affidavit that they're not using the ballot that was issued to them. Um, do the people that are online understand what we're talking about? Do you have questions? They're mute. Most of them are muted. Well, and I don't have microphone. There's no microphones out. There, there's, there's like there's a, a one microphone. Oh, oh, they should the, be able to hear us. Okay. Somebody has a question. Just ask it. Sounds good. Uh, we can hear, or at least I can hear you. This is Thanks. Lynn. Okay. Um. So with with the voter check in, um, when people when people um, sign in during their session, that we'll give them a different colored pencil. So the main reason for that is they kind of know what marks they've made on the checklist, and then if corrections have to be made, we'll figure out what time of day it was or whatever. Um, so when the voter comes in, there's a little sign that says, please state your name loud and clear. Voter states their name, and then the election worker will repeat or will um, come back with their address. And that way, you know you're on the right line. Um, like in the case of Robert Smith, there's four Robert Smiths. Um, so they, you'll, you'll be sure that you're checking off the right one. Um, and then if it gets down to it, um, there is a year of birth for most voters now on the checklist. And so if it's a junior senior situation, oh. you you can ask the voter their year of birth if you're trying to fi figure out which one to check off. Um, and voters that have already returned their early absentee ballot are pre-checked on the checklist. I can actually pull up um, should as I? As long as you are on the topic of affidavits, if somebody who is registered in Jericho mm -hmm. comes in to vote and doesn't bring their ballot, they have to also sign an affidavit saying that they already lost it or threw it away or whatever. Yeah, they're not, they didn't <laughs> already send it. That's a, um, not voting for And I had shared this is what Barry Town uses. And the and I was just going to have one since we're divided into four in the alphabet. I was just going to divide the list into four as opposed to trying to make it, you know, each letter of the alphabet. And the only concern that different town clerks have kind of commented on this is privacy. Like if they had their own piece of paper, you would only know that that person, you know, signed an affidavit. But I don't. I don't I think privacy like, is a like big concern. It's not, it's not yeah, it's not. So like, yeah, just saying I didn't. I didn't yeah. vote twice. Um, one problem we did see in November of 2022 when they signed, we, there's a place for them to print their name and sign their name. Like five of them were completely unreadable. Illegible, yeah. So trying to coax the voter to yeah. um, to make it. So I don't know. Do you want me to pass this around? 
Um, and then voters before the election, um, they'll be filling out this because it may be a particular day. You know, it's different than the election day. It's the same. Yeah. It's the same uh, yeah. statement. But so those will be filing alphabetically in a book. And it does make a difference at the end of the day what, well, or the next two days following the election. We have to kind of account for all the issued ballots. And so with the affidavit, we can cancel the absentee request and then have them participate, show that they participated voting in person or voting in absentee in a different town. <laughs> Uh, and two, they're, they're, they are taking either an oath or affirmation. So if they do vote in more than one town, this is a document that will be used to, um, you know, pursue, pursue that. So it's under the pains and penalties of perjury. We won't pursue it, but the attorney general's office will. Um, also, too, since we're at Mount Mansfield, a lot sometimes we'll get people from other towns coming in, especially Underhill, because they see the signs vote at MMU. And um, I actually need to confirm, I believe Underhill is voting at um, the Underhill Town Hall. They hold their town meeting at Browns River Middle School, but I think they're voting at Underhill Town Hall. So when a voter comes to the entrance and they can't find if you can't find their name on the checklist that's the first question to ask are you do you live in Jericho <laughs> um and MMU students sometimes we get that too but school will not be in session on November 5th which makes a huge relief with parking um and then so on the checklist it will be important to look in the absentee ballot status because some are issued a ballot and then some are already returned. So they're pre-checked and the other options could be that it's been requested, but not issued, but that shouldn't be the case on election day. And then if someone submits a defective absentee ballot, like they didn't sign it or they didn't include an absent or a signature envelope, they have the opportunity to cure it if it's before election day. So there's a code CUR that it's a cured ballot and their name should be checked off the checklist too. It's already pre-checked. Um, and then in the voter status column, it's important to look at if the voter is challenged, there's a C next to their name. And in that case, um, I they, they need to sign an affidavit that they still either live at the address that we have on the checklist or they have a new address in Jericho. But if, if they're challenged and they're like, oh no, I did move to Essex, but I just thought I could vote here because um, I haven't registered yet, well, they can't um, because they can't confirm, they can't affirm that they have a Jericho address, but there is voter, same day voter registration. So they can go to Essex and, you know, vote in the town that they now live in. I see a question. Um, I just wanted to point out. Yeah, that I was just going to comment. Good, thanks. Oh, that Sven was waiting. Yeah, he said his hand up. Yeah. Do you, do you have something? Um, I do. Um, so is it just your office that will do the curing of absentee mislabeled or ballots and not the not any of the sort of election workers on election day? Yeah, it, it would not fall to an election worker to cure to have someone cure an absentee ballot. Most of the time they would get cured before election day, but if the person hasn't responded, it's possible that um, they'll come in election day and and then that would be someone to send to me. So it will it will actually show that they returned a ballot. Um, it won't show that it was defective, 
it will but it will just say that it's returned but um if they know they need to cure it then they then that's something that I would do or Megan could walk them through it okay all right thanks um we have had people cure their ballot on election day or in that case yeah. they can actually just take it and vote it through the <laughs> through the tabulator can i raise yeah a concern that happened the last time i worked through, through, through. anyway um it's not appropriate to have conversations while you're looking at the election about your preference for candidates and your opinions of candidates and then uh, please it, it, working at the election should be nonpartisan. In the same way that people can't wear buttons in there or hand out paperwork, it's yeah. the non-political. Right. So we do have a polling place activities policy, and we started that in 2006. And it's kind of interesting. At the time, we actually said no cell phones in the polling place. But um, you can't do that now. Yeah. 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 Like it's <laughs> phones are attached to people now. And so if a voter comes in with their phone, and sometimes they do use it to look up candidate, name candidate name. information while they're in the voting booth, that's fine. But they can't broadcast anything from it. They shouldn't be taking pictures, although some people take pictures of their ballot, <laughs> you know. If they're using it for their own use, that's okay. But um no distribution or advertising or and the whole filming public. thing. They yeah. they shouldn't be filming other voters because yeah. that's kind of an intimidating yeah. act yeah. or we can be. Um and then as it goes for poll workers, it's funny because um I I had brought this up before. I was like, is this kind of outdated that we're not letting people use their phones? And Mary Jane said, no, <laughs> you are, you should be focused on what you're doing. So you're, if you're using your phone, like you should not be on social media. Oh, I'm at the polls. And I think this <laughs> candidate's going to, you know, do this or whatever, like that, sh that would be inappropriate. But if you're just using your phone, like to read a book while you're, you know, waiting or whatever, like if it's your own personal use or, you have kids at home and you, you know, you may be anticipating a call or whatever. Like, I don't think we can keep people from using their phones for that, but there is kind of a, a professionalism or what did you say? Calculate. Well, you can use, yeah, using it for a calculator, but like they shouldn't be taking away from your attention to the voter. So hopefully that's not just what happened here in Jericho, but what if someone were to show up and say, I'm going to videotape you working because I suspect Jericho is fraudulent. And and they said, no, you can't stop me. It's, I'm in a public place. I'm going to use my phone or a video camera to record the workers and who's voting. So you might be bringing up the First Amendment audits. There are people that um, come to the town office and yes, they're recording and it is their right mm -hmm. and the best way to deal with those people is just let them go about their business because what they're looking for is a confrontation that they can post on youtube mm -hmm. and they get paid for it yeah. or i don't really know exactly yeah, how they get paid yeah. for it yeah. so at the school um if school was in session the school would actually shut them down because mm -hmm. of student privacy yeah like um yep. the yep. principal was really clear about that clear but like he did not want the media there and i was like well they're gonna be here or whatever yeah. but he's like yeah. they cannot video student you know so there's uh so it's even it's trickier because we're in the school but, they won't, they won't be but school's not in session so i don't think we can stop somebody from taking pictures i think that that's a first amendment issue you, you mentioned that before. People shouldn't be taking pictures during. That's what There's, I, that, that's what I mean, and, and think I, about. It. I was going to bring that up also. I, yeah. I'm not sure what the grounds are. So. Well, when the media comes, well, our our 
polling policy says you can't take pictures of someone without their permission. But is that but, it, but is that is that legal? Is that constitutional? It's is, our it's the it's the Jericho Board of Civil Authorities policy. But, but we don't get we don't overrule the laws in the world. Is it enforceable? Is it's probably not enforceable. Yeah. That's brilliant. But like the media would take pictures of people's feet in the you know, unidentifiable sort of things. Because they, they're trying to be they're trying to be appropriate and professional. Yeah. But if someone was there just to be confrontational and try to stir things up, they do yeah. we have can we I think we I would imagine we can't stop them from taking a picture or taking video. I think if they you were ask them not to say our policy is to not allow this. It's privacy is because people voting they shouldn't feel like they're being watched while they're voting it, yeah it can be it, you i think you could frame it that it's intimidating a voter from participating in the process if they're going to be filmed um, but so i have a question not an opinion to express i'm confused because it seemed like within the scope of two minutes we heard that cell phone use and photography should be kept at a minimum for respect out of respect for voter privacy to people can take films videos of voters and poll workers if they want to and there seems to be a bit of a disconnect there so i'm just looking for some guidance on where that's what the ground is that's what i think we're talking about exactly that. there is a disconnect I think, I think yeah. the, the disconnect is that or my the question in my head is if our policy is you can't use your phone for photos or video or whatever, can someone say, I mean, we, we can make any policy, we'll we can make a policy saying you can't vote unless you're wearing a red shirt. But that's not gonna hold up in court. Like we can't we can't defend that. And I'm wondering if this if our cell phone photograph video policy is also not defensible. I'm not, and I'm yeah, and and I'm, and honestly, I'm just thinking like worst case scenario if someone decides to try to stir things up. I don't want to derail us into a 45 minute discussion of First Amendment rights, but and I, I don't think we've got the answer here. I I, I, I might suggest that that Jessica uh, asked the Secretary of State's yeah. office for yeah. guidance on yeah. Um, and and you know, there's legitimate purposes, right? People who are there for their poll watch. There may be a difference between like some sort of legitimate poll watcher. I don't know how that works. Versus someone who's who's just coming in there unaffiliated, but I think they know they not answer this question. So I think we probably get an answer pretty quickly from them. I just started googling it, but I it'll take. Me so a, a poll watcher is someone who is generally positioned behind the entrance checklist, and they actually, in order to be a poll watcher, they sign off on agreeing to the polling place activities policy. So in that case, I think it would be enforceable because it's. The, the current policy. But as far as First Amendment rights, I think <clears throat> av avoiding confrontation is the best. And if if the person is impeding somebody's right to vote or, you know, it's not happening in a peaceful manner, then it would actually be law enforcement that could help us. We wouldn't really, we wouldn't really be enforcing it. It would it would be through law enforcement. I think there's value in just getting some clarity here. Um, we don't have to speculate any further. It would be yeah. my recommendation. And I, I agree. Kind of see where we're at um, on that. And I think there's. I think. I think we probably have a pretty clear answer to it. And um, kind of along that vein, new this year. So it was new in August for the August state primary. There's a with our warning and sample ballot and everything posted, there's also a new state law that there's no uh, guns allowed in the polling place. So there's no guns allowed at the school anyway, but in the case of the town office, that's posted out front right now because yeah. this is acting as a, as a polling place. And the secretary of state has been clear on that. It's by law, we need to post it, but it's not our job to enforce it. Um, other if if it if if they're not there in a peaceful manner, then yes, that is something that and that actually has happened at Jericho Elementary. It was a voter and a 
person campaigning, the voter was like coming up in their face and um, saying why they didn't agree with them. And I actually came out and I was like, if you can't be peaceful, you know, I'm going to have to call somebody or whatever. And they just backed away and went to their car. So I think they were just getting, you know, heated in the moment. They didn't realize they were attracting attention. But it was a voter that came in that said, there's something going on in the parking lot or whatever. So yes, that would, yeah, because it should be free, fair, and accessible, the election. I think I found it. Vermont election law does not address the issue of photography or videography in polling places. However, the Media Guide to Vermont Elections on the website of the Vermont Secretary of State makes the following statement. Every stage of the election process in Vermont is public. The media and the public have the right to be present and observe the election. However, the presiding officer can set rules for administration of the election as provided by Vermont election law. That's the statement. And then there's um, more about it, and I can send that to you. And we can pass it out to everybody. Yep, just and I can I can follow up too for I think it makes more sense clarity. To call the yep. State and just no. get there directly from them. Glad we're having this meeting ahead of <laughs> November fifth. Um, so I, I found it helpful when I think it was in 2020, when Bob Robbins said, let's do a mock check-in. Um, so I, I have, I printed off a checklist. I don't know, if, do we, do we want to do that? Or do we just want to throw out different scenarios and what you would do or. It seems like if the people who are in the room are concerned, <laughs> everyone that I see in the room here has done has it done it before. Yeah. Times. I'd be interested to know whether the people online feel that would be useful. Okay. To, to watch us do it. Right. So would the people online be interested in watching a mock check-in? Or have any questions well, about checking in? When I work with elections, when, when somebody else comes in, if they haven't done it before, they just sit with you and say for the first five seconds. Yeah. And yeah. Bring it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, the you know the general checking in, I think you know, we all we all figure that out, and you can do a quick three minute training for someone who's new as you're sitting next down, they're sitting like down next to you. Um, for me, it's it's the you know okay, I'm a new. I'm a new voter and we've got to, you know, give you the oath or, um, yeah, you know, there's some sort of ballot issue uh, or whatever. And that's when we tend to go, Jessica, right. um, but yeah, I would just say that sometimes that's a challenge because it's, it's busy. So uh, I guess my only recommendation or question would be, and I think Megan can handle a lot of that too, which is great. Um, but should we be thoughtful about our staffing and maybe have, um, you know, a backup backup, you know, Jessica, um, Megan, Jessica, Megan, or somebody them. else, and you know, whoever's available can handle it and uh, kind of make yeah. sure that there's there's generally three people available at any given time. Yeah. And, you know, between now and then when we, you know, when the election is we determine that person, those people are, just make sure they read your your written down things and have a conversation with you. Yeah. But I do think there's value in that. That's just been a bottleneck, I feel like. So there is a JP or a BCA member in each shift. So that person could be the the third um, backup. It'd be important for that person to really be well-versed. Right? No, in, yeah. In all those outlier situations. Yeah. Um, Cause like if I were doing it, my thought would be like, oh, I don't know, let's go ask Jessica. Yeah. 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 So I wouldn't be a good third person because. And uh, this is Peter. Yeah, so this, I think I sent this out I this afternoon, did. but so this is in the front of every book. And so it talks about check-in, but then it also says um, scenarios involving absentee ballots. So the voter shows up without their ballot, they forgot it or lost it. So they sign the affidavit of no ballot cast. Voter shows up with their absentee ballot and wants to vote the ballot in person. So in the past, we've checked that person we've in color 
because they're not absentee and we've written VIP, but there's actually going to be a lot of them this election. So the most important thing is checking them off in color. Um, and they can vote their ballot that was mailed to them. Some people think that the ballot that was mailed to them can somehow be tracked. So they don't want to vote the ballot that was mailed to them so they can return it as and rip it in half. We have a replaced ballot tin and that person can get a new ballot and go to the poll and go to the booth. And then some people might already have their ballot marked. They just need to get their name checked off and then they can go right to the vote tabulator, put their ballot through. The important thing is if the voter shows up with anyone else's ballot but their own, it should be inside that signature envelope. And then that ballot does not get checked in at the time with the person there. That ballot goes in the absentee ballot tin and will get checked off later. Is everything you just said on that piece of paper? Yep. Okay. That was, so there's those four scenarios. I appreciate that review because that clutch seems to be the most common things that we encounter. Hopefully it's every scenario that could happen, but someone will <laughs> break the mold. And then voters added on election day, they're added at the end after Z. So we don't try to put them in alphabetically. And that way at the end of the night, there's a clear, oh, there was 14 people that voted, registered to vote on election day. Um, and then also in the front of the book is a sample of someone that voted in person with the VIP checked off in color and the VIP next to their name. And then the other thing that comes up is the person checked in error. And this actually happened, I, this scenario here <laughs> is, um, I think this was the April April election, uh, new voter, new election worker, really excited. And so Tom Jocelyn was like the first or second person to vote like at seven o'clock in the morning and they checked off Ben instead. <laughs> And so they were like, oh, no, what do I do? And so they wrote um, 7 a.m., checked in error next to Ben's name, and they checked off Tom. And then when Ben came to vote at 545, they checked him off in the new color so that we we knew that we could count that check. Um, so that's, that's the tricky part if the person gets, um, if the name gets checked off in, in error. And you probably weren't even aware that the whole thing happened, right? As a voter, you didn't know. It was after you left the room, I think the the um, election worker was like, what do I do? <laughs> um, so actually it's better not to erase because erasing, then you don't know at the you've end lost, of the night, lost data. Lost. you lost data, but you also don't know, is that a valid mark right. or not? So this way it's clear. Yes, we know the yes, story. I, yes, I shouldn't have. Here's the story. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I don't think there's anyone in the waiting room. That's good. So I don't know if there's any more questions from Zoom participants. Uh, this is Keith. I do have one comment. Um, the third person, um, contact person besides yourself, Megan, it would be um, helpful if when we come to our shift that that person is uh, you know identified um, yeah. yeah identified active actively identified to us maybe megan could make a special colored band on their name tag or something oh that's the yep. name tag name tag symbol <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea, actually. Does it make sense but as you're going, kind of going through the list and uh, the election day worker list that you kind of will, you know, be able to tag somebody in each shift that'll be that third person. You can talk with them, make sure they're okay with it, and then make sure they have all the information they need ahead of time to feel like they they can. So I'm actually counting on um, the JPs that just signed up. Um, Six thirty, Mary Coburn. 9.30, we have Michelle and Kathy. 12.30, Mike Sweeney. 3.30, we have um, K. 
Carol and Kathleen. And then 645. We so can ask the, questions. So those people all feel like you you know what to do and so de definitely reviewing this instruction sheet ahead of time and letting me know if there's anything to, um, you know, anything you want to see added or changed. So what's not in this instruction sheet, which is something Tom asked for earlier, is processing absentee ballots, like what's the um, sequence. And we do have the chain of custody. So when we're when we're doing it here before the election, I think that is easy to follow with the chain of custody sheet. But on election day, there's two types of absentee ballots, ones that have already been pre-checked in. So they are checked off on the checklist. And then the ones that take longer that are returned that day they have not been checked off the checklist. So before, well, you confirm how many you have, but then you actually have to go to the entrance checklist and get those names checked off before you put them through the vote tabulator. So there's like an extra step. So that is something that I will write out um, for absentee ballot processing. I see Lynn has a hand up. Hi, yeah, I, I just wondered, I signed up for the 645 to the end, and is there anything that somebody who's working that shift should know that it seems like that's a bit of a different role than checking people in during during the, the voting during the day? Yes, and the first thing that you will be doing at 7 o'clock, we can actually close out the voting machines and the vote tabulator. Um separates off the write-in votes into a different compartment, but they make us look through the rest of the ballots to make sure there's no write-in. So um, Lynn, that's gonna be, you'll be paired with other people, but that will be your primary um, role at 645. And last time it was actually, they're not here. So there's, uh, Victoria Tibbetts will also be there that at that time frame, and she did it in August. And uh, I wanted to ask Victoria and Sandy if they actually found any write-in ballots. I think these new machines are very good because um, even if the person didn't fill in a circle, but there's something written in the write-in section, it will divert it to the write-in compartment. So I actually don't think there I, were I any, any of this, but I, I'll confirm that a ahead. But a good question, Lynn. I think that's all I have. I have a question about some some people that come in and just maybe they're the, your neighbor down the street or whatever, but they never say their name. They think you, you know. You should know their name. You should know their name. That's the worst. Yeah. So there is a sign in front that says, please state your name loud and clear. But, so you can always point to it. Tell me. I can hear you. Right. And if there's a poll, if there is a poll watcher behind you, it is appropriate for the voter to be saying their name because that's what the poll watcher is relying on. Um, so, yeah. It, I would just say, hey, okay. hey, great, great to see you. Legally, you got to say your name. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Of course, it's you, Mary. Thanks. <laughs> just tell them legally you have to state your name. Right. Okay. Good. It was interesting in Essex. Uh, the Essex town clerk had posted a question. Someone wanted to change their name on the checklist to three letters instead of their name. And she's like, can they do that? And I was like, well, if everyone did that, we wouldn't know who, who anyone was or whatever. So I told her, I usually just go by what's on the driver's license because the voters get verified by their driver's license number and in the past, we have had like Shad, everyone knew Shad as Shad, but his real name was Richard. So he was on the checklist as Shad when I first started, but I didn't think it was, um, you know, when they started using the driver's license, I had to change his name to Richard so that I could verify him in the system. And so I told the Essex town clerk, I didn't get any pushback when I let those people know I had to change it to their legal name. <laughs> And actually, there was the case on Old Pump Road 
The man was from Canada. So legally, his first name was Joseph. Like, I guess a lot of people in Canada are Joseph and Mary. And but he used he used a different name like around town. And I think it was Paul. And so when I got I was trying to like match everybody and I was like, he doesn't have a driver's license number. And his daughter says, oh, no, he, he does. It's Joseph. Because now with the verify ID at the DMV, you have to use your birth certificate. So that's that's his first name on his birth certificate. So some some voters. They end up they do use their legal name and you don't know who they are. <laughs> Can I ask a ridiculous question? Please. What is a right-handed check mark? Oh, there's a sample. Isn't there? Oh, is there's that, a little that, red. Is that? Okay. Yeah, that's a little red check. I'm left-handed, but I don't think about <laughs> what direction the check mark goes, and it's just check. <laughs> so, so do you make it that way, or do you make it the other yeah, way? Actually, wrong. On the <laughs> yeah, I can't. <laughs> yes. Okay. I can't do it backwards. I don't know what that. Okay. Okay. I good. Sure yeah, because okay. that actually is a problem. At the Kathleen could probably touch you know counting at the end of the night if if they're not not as in you don't know if it's a mark yeah or a check yeah. and if it's mr messier don messier used to like make a check yeah. mark that oh went through God. five people's yeah. names and so like that's not helpful having it um you know stay in the line yeah yeah so good question okay. <laughs> I was just thinking the about the other night and i was like I don't know. yes any other questions about this Seven forty. I think is that everything on the list? Oh, just the vote tabulator. Is this the last meeting until we reorganize? I think it would be helpful to have a follow up meeting after this meeting, um, because. I have been to three different election trainings like within the last 30 days. Nationally, there's a huge push to make elections more secure. And I think there's threats in other states that we're not seeing in Vermont, but there are resources to make our infrastructure secure and then like have a plan B, like if, if you if the road if Brown's Trace is closed, you know, because of some disaster or whatever, where would our polling site be on election day? You know, like if you have to make these decisions in the middle of the night, where would they be? Or like Barry Town had a gas leak nearby the Barry Auditorium, so they had to move their polling place during election day. And you know, what are the things that you need to grab? when you're moving, how do you secure the machines and the ballots and stuff? So, um, but there, so actually I wanna do a walkthrough with someone from a federal level, it's free. They, they can come and they can show you where all your problems are and then, you know, try to have a plan to fix it. So I think it, I think we would have a meeting like November or first week of December, just to kind of review plus get feedback from people who have um, volunteered as additional election officials, you know, like what what they thought about. I don't know, or is, is that what other people are? I think it's good to wrap up mm -hmm. before, before our February meeting. Were you gonna ask a question about what you and I talked about at the town meeting reimagined about the parties? No. Is that appropriate to discuss? Sure. Any other business? Yeah, so we've got 13 JPs running and none of them are Republicans. Or progressive. Right. It's it's 12 Democrats and one independent. Um which is gonna make it, it impossible to do to do all the things where we a Democrat and Republican go to do things together. That's not required. That's a good practice. But it's not required. Yeah, you do the best you can, but there may be write-ins, like so you don't really know. That. Right of course, they wouldn't be write-ins as a particular party; they would be right. write-ins as an individual. Um, but yeah, that's not the first um 
that's not the first town to have, I think it's the first time in Jericho that this has happened, but it's not the first time that it's happened in other towns. And those in Underhill, and in fact, the select board did not, did not choose to appoint anybody from the BCN. So they just run the, whatever their number is, all Democrats run their BCA. Yeah, the balance of parties would be ideal, but also independents have the right to be represented too. Like Richmond has a BCA member that runs as an independent and he's been doing it for forever. forever. Yeah. Anybody else have anything that we need to do before we finish up? Are we ready to go home? Thanks to the people who came virtually. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And they wrote their names, so I'm going to.